This is a diagram that we've um, put together at our center with some of our research um, showing the importance of livestock-related greenhouse gases compared to the other sectors. So as you can see from this picture, I'm going to try to turn around and look at it without losing my microphone. Um, the 2000, this is the 2010 emissions um, from agriculture below, and above is all the other sectors, industry, buildings, energy, transportation. Um, and then if you see the uh, next box, is the agricultural um, emissions, if business as usual, if our diets don't change and con continue on that trajectory I showed you in 2050. This is the threshold that was set that emissions need to stay under in order to um, stay under that the two degrees uh, rise in temperature by 2050 um, that the climate committee has put has set back in uh, 2015 I believe so what do we see with the problem is this the problem here um, usually I have people talk back to me but you can see the problem is that if agri if we continue to eat as as we are now we have to squish all of the other sectors into that tiny little space between the top of the orange box and that red line so that, um, so our likelihood of doing that is very, very small. So we definitely need to change what we eat. This mod, some of the, the scenarios we've drawn um, and we're working on more is that if we can all decrease our meat by 75%, less meat and dairy, and also uh, we can bring it down some, and then also less food waste, if you include food waste in that, which is a large part of the emissions, we can, we can bring that down. So there is a possibility, but we do need to make shifts. And I think cities are a great place to talk about this. Uh, this is just showing, uh, this diagram shows um, what we eat actually is very significant. And you can see on the far right, um, and this is from some modeling that we've done with all 100, with 150 countries in their typical diets, you can see that bovine meat and beef uh, ruminants are the highest greenhouse gas producers of all foods. And all the plant-based foods are over on the left. Um, we also know the evidence demonstrates that healthier diet patterns with lower amounts of meat, such as vegetarian, pescatarian, Mediterranean, um, are also better for the health as well as better for planet. So you can see that translating to greater reductions in diabetes, cancer, coronary mortality, and also lower emissions. In terms of cities, consumption also matters. So this is a study of C40 cities that shows that greenhouse gas emissions, particularly in Europe, North America, and Oceania, are greater than sector-based emissions. In fact, 70 over 70% of consumption um, emissions come from uh, housing, utility, transportation, and food. And of the food, meat is the biggest category of that. Uh, this is some of the modeling we've done looking at dietary shifts and the reduction we can do in greenhouse gases. And if you look at just the orange lines, the blue and green are water, which I don't have time to spend on. But if you can see just the decrease in greenhouse emissions as a per capita based on, you can see the vegan diet, which is also obviously the greatest uh, reduction you can make. And then different scenarios of diets um, well, on the left being the meatless day. Um, although the vegan is the greatest uh, reduction, um, we do want to find the diet and the dietary shifts that are possible uh, for all of for more people to make. So while a vegan diet might be the best, it's not always plausible for everybody to go vegan, but we can make smaller shifts. And that's really one of what I want to present today. This is a very complicated, long, and <laughs> way too busy slide, but it really what it shows is these are the many countries across the bottom, all the different countries in the model, and you can see some countries have their typical diet, have depending on the, their, um, this also includes the trade indices, where the food is produced, and you can see the red line on top is the typical diet, and then those different diets that have been modeled down below, and the countries that have um, higher meat consumption, as well as uh, ones in like South America where the um, rainforests are being destroyed for uh, crops, you have the higher impact. So you can see it differs by country. Um, showing that really our responsibility, there's a responsibility of our countries that are higher meat eating um, and meat producing to, um, to make those reductions. Um, so I'd like to suggest to you when addressing health and sustainability that less meat really should be on the agenda. It's simple, it's cost effective, and it's impactful. Less meat can be a focus of many city policies, um, sectors, and activities from health campaigns to business and policy groups. Um, there's many ways, it's a long list and it could be longer, but meat reduction can be prioritized in many areas that are already in food policy, the food policy areas we've heard of, from, um, from city, city sustainability 
policies to purchase, so using the city's purchasing power um, in their own city procurement and as well as influencing others, uh, schools, institutions, and green businesses. Um, also with healthy food and diet standards, um, including meat in those, and with consumer focused strategies. Um, I would also like to suggest Meatless Monday and similar initiatives as um, ways to start bringing this into the conversation. Meatless Monday, um, as it is today, began in 2003 with this message, one day, a meat, go without, one day a week, go without meat. Very simple message and a very small reduction, but a big, but a big step. And uh, it's really for the health, for, for physical health, as well as the health of the planet. And the time is right um, for such initiatives, and especially in urban areas we see here in Tel Aviv as well. There's a growing interest in um, eating less meat, and the, different and the dietary trends, the culinary trends are changing such that vegetables are more the, uh, can be the center of the plate. Um, it's also a way to introduce meat reduction when there's awareness is very low. So there's many opportunities um, to reduce meat in our own, first in our own government offices, um, our health departments, our institutions, our rest, restaurants through Meatless Monday or similar initiatives. Um, Meatless Monday also, and meat reductions also lend themselves very well to evaluation. I know that evaluating is a, evaluation is a main um, part of this conversation today. Um, you can set targets for procurement. You can look upstream at the emissions and, and, and actually measure the emissions that are reduced from different changes you've made. Um, you can look at schools and institutions and programs that have been implemented and the evaluations of those. One more slide. Um, there's many other cities that have taken this on. I just want to read this quote um, by a Los Angeles city councilman about this. It says, if we do it one plate at a time, one meal, one day, we're ratcheting down the impact of our environment. We're starting with one day a week, and then who knows, maybe we can change our habits for a lifetime. So just to encourage you to um, you know, consider this as you're looking at your policies and your programs and in, in making these small shifts that can make bigger impacts later on as they continue on. So thank you. Uh, one second, Spike, before, before um, uh, I guess one of the perks of being a moderator, I get to ask a question. Uh, quick question. It's something I struggle with as somebody who works with patients and we're, you know, we're always telling, advocating healthy diets, eating less meat, and it's, it's so hard for people to understand what is healthy when one day they hear it's good to eat uh, skinless chicken, it's good to have fish at least three times a week, um, they should reduce their milk, they should have more dairy for their bones, and paleo is one of the most you know, popular diets. So how do I now, when you struggle so much to get them to eat healthy, you now bring up the environmental impact of changing your diet habits? It's, it's so difficult for me. I just want to ask for your... Uh, it's a bait of the dietitian's existence when you're doing health education and, you, you know, the science is not changing as much as the media is changing the science and so you're always responding to what people are hearing and uh, that's very difficult. So um, I think just uh, bringing in this environmental perspective is so important uh, to everything we do and we're not talking about, you know, not having enough meat. We just need to talk about having, I mean, not having meat at all but talk, talk about having more plant-based food. So it really does go along dietary guidelines but we need to continue to emphasize this balance. I think it's the best way. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and our next speaker is uh, Spike Mendelson. Uh, Spike is coming from the food program in D.C., from the D.C. Food Policy Program. But um, I think more importantly, Spike is a very well-known chef. And he had a very successful restaurant tour. And I don't know if this is true, but rumor has it that one of your restaurants was one of the fam uh, favorites of President Obama. Um, he's from Washington, D.C. So, Spike. Good afternoon, everyone. Shalom, Tel Aviv. Woo! You guys excited out there? It's a little calm. Both of these? Okay. There we go. Uh, so yeah, uh, I'm Spike Mendelson. I'm a local chef in uh, the DC area. I have uh, numerous uh, fast casual restaurants. And I also happen to chair the DC Food Policy Council on behalf of Mayor Bowser, which pretty much promotes uh, good food policy and uh, hopefully creates opportunity for effective change within uh, the district. Uh, I know we are a little on time, so I'm just gonna get, jump right into the uh, presentation. There we go, that's the first slide, just went through that. 
Uh, I just want to let you guys know I traded in my chef coat and knife today for a suit and a clicker, so hope it all goes well. Uh, so just to go over a little bit of the lay of the land, uh, DC is 68.5 square miles. It has 700,000 plus residents. Uh, it also, unlike any other city in the US, the District of Columbia functions as a city, county, and state. We have a strong business environment, a growing food economy, uh, a diverse uh, population, and it's also a sustainability leader among cities. Uh, we're number one in Energy Star labeled buildings per capita, also number one in citywide green power usage, just to name a few. Uh, it's also part of a larger metropolitan area with uh, Virginia and Maryland as our neighbors. Uh, we have 133 neighborhoods, uh, 320 advisory neighborhood commissions. Okay, the district's food system by numbers. So the district has seen an incredible growth of its food system over the last five years. We have increased access to healthy foods through more grocery stores, uh, healthy corner stores, farmers markets, and summer feeding sites for when children are out of school. Uh, there also has been increased efforts on connecting residents to the food system through community gardens, urban farms, and school gardens. Uh, and yet, with all this positivity and all these great numbers you see, uh, we know that healthy food access continues to be a problem in the district. Uh, nearly 15% of the district's residents are food insecure, and rates of diet-related chronic disease continue to rise, especially among low-income residents, black residents, and residents in wards seven and eight. Acknowledging the contrast between the many resources and continued disparities of health, food access, and diet-related chronic diseases in the district, we decided to create a Food Policy Council in 2015. Okay, so.